Today we're gonna to get into some live data and kind of an analysis of some of the research tools that companies are using and maybe your own investment strategies are using out there with a company named Masari. Uh, actually, full disclosure, I actually use this company and have used it for a few months, find it very interesting. But welcome back to the show. My name is Paul Barron. And of course on TechPath, as you guys know, we jump into blockchain topics. We also cover EV, AI, innovations, and a lot around kind of this next generation technology and data is a big part of that. And especially when you look at blockchain, we've really seen a few companies start to kind of break the mold and bring some new products to market. So I wanted to bring Mr. Ryan Selkis on, who is the founder and CEO over at Masari. Great to have you. Thank you for having me. Excellent, Ryan. So let's jump into a little bit about Masari. If I understood the name, money in, is is it uh, Lebanese or the name? Where, where did that name come from? I, no, I, I think uh, Masari with an A is actually um, ah. money in Arabic or, or Arabic, really some yeah. uh, Middle Eastern countries, uh, but I'm, I'm pretty sure it's Arabic. And then um, Masari with an E, which is uh, what we are, um, actually refers back to the merchants of Venice. Uh, the the ah, Masari okay. were the treasurers that popularized double entry bookkeeping. So the, the quip here is uh, crypto ledgers and, and these decentralized technologies are going to be as transformative for, for global capitalism as, uh, as double entry bookkeeping was for the birth of modern capitalism uh, because it, it made uh, commerce easier to do between uh, trusted counterparties since they could compare each other's books. So um a little bit of a uh, history, history lesson and uh, <laughs> good and a history. Cool, trademarkable name. Yes, yeah, cool right. Trademarkable name. So mm -hmm. I like it. Let's talk a little bit about how you guys, from a, a standpoint of the data and also the technology that's basically in, integrated to on chain data. There's a couple of companies that we've talked to here on the show before that are really moving into on chain data and kind of the aspect of it. What kind of makes you guys a little different than maybe a traditional? Well, uh, in terms of a traditional data company that's that's catering to financial services clients more broadly, um, we're just paying yeah. attention a lot more. I, th I think you know Bloomberg and S and P and some of the legacy you know data companies, um, they're paying attention to maybe a handful of assets at this point: um, uh, Bitcoin, Ethereum, and, and maybe you know one or two right. others. Um, but uh, when it comes to, to crypto data companies, I, I think there's uh, there's a number of providers, uh, many of which we work with actually as partners, because we consider ourselves more of an aggregator and curator of high quality crypto data and research. Um, today, uh, we ingest markets data from a third party platform called Kaiko. We ingest uh, on chain data from a combination of third party providers and then uh, open blockchains themselves uh, and come up with our own analytics. Um, we are able to ingest third-party APIs you know, directly into our charting and, and screener and filters, uh, filtering tools interface. And then um, we also have a robust uh, research library, uh, a full-time research team, and then an extended research community that's essentially building the equivalent of uh, a distributed sell-side research library. So, mm. you know, in traditional finance, you have Goldman Sachs, JP Morgan, right. Morgan Stanley analysts covering public equities. There's no such structure in crypto. So we basically play matchmaker between independent analysts and then some of these projects and their communities that are looking to fund some type of independent coverage um, as an investor you know, resource, uh, but that is an overtly marketing material. So uh, we do a little bit of everything with the goal of ultimately organizing and, and better contextualizing this, this information for new investors. Yeah, when you, okay, so a couple of questions on that line there in looking at you know, investors like myself also, we do it as, you know, part of our content model here to understand really what's happening in the marketplace. So we use a lot of different tools. What are investors and or general uh, data bugs looking for today when it comes to, you know, to on-chain data or in general, what's happening in the crypto space? Do you think it's just access to the litany of projects out there or do you feel like they're zoning in on some core features that are really starting to surface as, the key things they should be watching? It really depends on what type of asset you're talking about. I think people that come into crypto for the first time think about Bitcoin and then they think of the right. prolifer pro proliferation of other currencies uh, as, as you know, all essentially being the same, different flavors of, of the, the same thing that Bitcoin is. And in reality, you have uh, a, a number of different types of networks. So um, 
obviously uh, collectibles has been a big theme this year. Digital art has been a big theme this year with the rise of non-fungible tokens. Um, and that's really crossed over into you know, mainstream retail adoption. Um, your classical you know, cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin and, and even Dogecoin, which became a meme itself yeah. earlier this year, um, those are actually legitimately used for payments and settlement. Um, if you look at uh, smart contract platforms like Ethereum, right, where all these applications are built, um, those in and of themselves are almost like the modern app stores uh, or, or the app stores for, for you know, decentralized uh, uh, crypto powered networks. Um, and then you've got this whole class of financial services, DeFi, right. that is actually processing transactions and, and, and really look like um, decentralized banks uh, or, you know, di uh, disintermediating different functions of, of, of modern banks and building them with protocols um, versus with centralized trusted institutions. So um, those actually generate fees, right? Uh, on network transactions and, and settlements actually generate fees. So you can think about investor ownership in, uh, in these different communities and, and different networks as um, almost like a share in a co-op um, or, or a mutual uh, in that they there's real economic throughput, there's fees that are generated, and then the owners of those networks have certain rights to the fees that are generated. Um, you compare that with NFTs or, you know, kind of other collectibles or, or digital goods um, or the traditional cryptocurrencies themselves like Bitcoin, and, and those are going to have a different set of drivers. So it, it really, the first thing uh, that you need to appreciate it is it's not one size fits all. And there's not one metric right. that people are looking at uh, as a silver bullet because there is you know, quite a bit of differentiation even within these assets. Yeah, we've seen a lot of uh, variations on some, just some of the services that have been out there on a lot of these type of platforms. And you're right, there, there seems to be certain areas where some platforms are very strong and then and they kind of focus in on one that I have kind of, and you mentioned it there, that I haven't really found the perfect one for, at least for me, and that is really being able to dive deep into the DeFi projects, uh, much deeper than what, mm -hmm. I mean, you've got DeFi Pulse and some of those on -site, you know, uh, websites out there that kind of give you a little bit of understanding what's happening there. But you guys actually go into the DeFi sector fairly well. Uh, any plans mm -hmm. to kind of expand on that? Uh, certainly. Uh, we just closed a, a $21 million Series A that we announced um, just a couple of weeks ago. Uh, that's going to be used primarily to uh, increase the number of, of full-time staff that we have, including the developers that are building these tools and the analysts that are covering these uh, these different sectors. So yeah. um, I think uh, one thing to keep in mind is that def decentralized finance applications have been around for a few years, but they really only started to catch fire last year. So we're, exactly. um, we're talking about um, a 12 month period where um, providers like ourselves and, and others have been working feverishly to, to just kind of uh, help people come up the learning curve. And um, data infrastructure companies are always going to be a laggard uh, when it comes to uh, actually covering these different assets because um, it's, uh, you know, if, if the market rallies, we will come, but uh, not necessarily if you build it, we will come. So uh, sure. without like a, a critical mass of users, that were actually paying attention to these uh, ecosystems, you know, 12 months ago, 18 months ago, um, the tools were just more rudimentary. Now, um, yeah. as interest has, has expanded um, and the sophistication of these protocols is much higher than it was um, even six months ago, you know, much less 12 months ago. Now uh, is, is when you're starting to see, you know, quite a bit of investment from ourselves and, and some of the other you know, top, top providers that are trying to make sense of what's going on in these on-chain environments. Yeah, for sure. You, obviously, you've been to market uh, with, you know, general <clears throat> programs in terms of raising capital, things of that nature. How do you see blockchain companies developing over, say, the next two to three years? Because we've seen so much growth this year, but I feel like there's just so much waiting in the wings right now, both on the sidelines from a capital standpoint, but also from innovation. You know, there's a lot of projects that are still just coming out of the chute things of that nature. Where do you see that going here in the next couple of years? Well, I think uh, at the end of the day, there's there's a lot of volatility and cyclicality in crypto. And we've seen multiple phases where there's been you know un, unbridled enthusiasm and, and euphoria um, at the market tops. And then you've seen you know pretty significant and, and, and long-term protracted corrections. And, and those environments tend to be where uh, the next 
phase of, of infrastructure is installed and, and, and the industry as a whole levels up and becomes capable of supporting mm -hmm. um, a larger user base, more significant capital inflows, has more kind of risk controls. Um, and, uh, and just, you know, generally speaking, you see more specialists that are, are solving some of the problems from the last cycle. And, you know, by the way, we're in that bucket ourselves. Uh, you know, yeah. Masari was born in the ICO boom in, in late 2017. And a core thesis that we had was if uh, any of these networks and any of these assets were going to become trusted by legitimate investors, you were going to need better information um, symmetry between, you know, retail uh, funds and then the, the participants in these communities. And you were going to have to work on not only fundamental data uh, drivers and value drivers for these emerging ecosystems, but uh, you were going to have to have some some off chain you know, transparency in terms of how these systems are governed, yeah. um, who the principals are, who some of the key stakeholders are, you know, even if they're pseudonymous, um, who, who's influencing decision making, what is the, the vision or, or trajectory of, of the project, whether it's driven by a you know, uh, a benevolent dictator or someone influential within the community, or it's driven, you know, by um, by a, a, a unique form uh, of, of, of you know, governance or, or kind of series of subcommittees that are responsible for different aspects of, of the, the protocol or, or the overall you know, project. And, um, and one of the most interesting things is you know, we're seeing a, a, a tremendous amount of innovation around the governance of these systems and, and corporate right. governance in general, keeping track of that in and of itself. Uh, is a full-time job. So I think um, when you think about the future of, of um, you know, blockchain companies, um, we're uh, we're obviously betting on a future where there are you know, thousands or, or tens of thousands of protocols that take the place of companies, uh, particularly with any type of marketplace, whether that's a, a financial marketplace, an information marketplace, talent, um, any you know, middleman um, that is uh, taking you know, a seat between a user, uh, uh, group of, of you know, data consumers or uh, service consumers and then data providers or, or service providers. Um, that is something that's that's apt to be you know, built with um, with the decentralized protocol. And um, there are going to be you know, different data points and different you know, bits of qualitative information that are important in informing people about um, the merits of those uh, as investments or the risks of, of uh, participating in, in one of those new emerging ecosystems and organizations. Yeah, for sure. Okay, so you mentioned this, and that is kind of a lot of these companies are moving into their development phase during what in most people reference as, you know, kind of the bear market. Do you feel like we're going to see that differently this time? Obviously with all the, you know, we've got institutional money moving in, you've got expansion, uh, obviously consumer awareness, you know, consumer retail awareness in terms of uh, investors. What are your thoughts on that? Do you think we'll see a softening in the market or do you feel like this is going to, you know, have a non-cyclical effect on this, this round? We're always going to see volatility um, from what height to what depth, who knows? That, that's just the, yeah. the, the nature of the market cycle. I, I think um, nothing is fundamentally changed to the negative that would impact the long-term thesis that these networks are going to continue to grow, proliferate. Uh, there will be a tremendous amount of innovation around them. But um, where we are in this particular cycle, um, it, it really is all over the map. Uh, could we yeah. could we be starting a slow and steady decline? Was sixty thousand the all time high for, uh, for for Bitcoin? Was was four thousand the all time high for ETH? I don't think so. But it's not you know without precedent that we could have just seen a, a nice relief rally and then you know uh, start trickling downward for for a multi year period. Um, on the other hand, in 2013 and 2017, we had similar environments where in, in May of those years, we had um, pretty sharp spikes in activity and, and price. And then uh, we saw a decline, a correction like we did this year. And then towards the end of the year and, and beginning of the following year, we saw you know, new all-time highs that were multiples higher than um, where you know, the May peaks had been. So I, I think that calendar um, coincidence is... Um, nothing really to read into there, but, uh, but I, I do think historically it just so happens that uh, if you're looking at this in terms of four year cycles, eight years ago, May we had a spike, a summer slump, and then a big December performance, uh, period of performance. Four years ago, we had a May spike, a summer slump, right. and then all time high performance. And now this year we've had um, a May uh, all time high, followed by a pretty significant summer slump. And, uh, and now things are starting to tick back up. So 
Um, yeah. Whether you know the mold breaks or, or, or not, I think the the long term trajectory of, uh, of of these different you know communities and, and the assets themselves is uh, is going up. Yeah, and I think you hit it on the head. Is that you really you can't go outside that. I mean, history kind of proves itself, but at the same time, you have to look back on that until it doesn't work anymore, and then then you have a new model that you've got to be able to track. Talk to me about well, the sample where size you, is so small too. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Talk to me about where you see quant going in the future. We've seen this in traditional trading and in terms of data, you know, you look at all sorts of platforms have started to kind of move into this. We've had a couple of people here on the show talking about this. How do you see quant really kind of playing into on-chain metrics? Well, I, I think it's uh, it's going to be you know critically important, um, and you know I'm I'm excited for some of the other uh, quantitative tools that are being developed for traders. Uh, you know, from from our and at Masari, um, we are not as uh, oriented towards onboarding you know, professional traders and, and mm -hmm. folks that are monitoring day-to-day -day swings in markets, so much as we are um, catering to the long-term investors and participants in these ecosystems. So many of our customers are um, funds in some cases, but, um, but the exchanges, the custodians, the wallets, um, the projects themselves, and, um, and other uh, teams and, and individuals that are focused on whether they're able to kind of keep tabs on um, support and, and ultimately participate uh, in, in these ecosystems in a more long-term manner. So you know, a good example would be governance. Um, if you are uh, at a, working at, at a major exchange um, and you're on the compliance or product team, you need to know what's going on with the 50 or so assets that your platform supports. Um, now, if there's a material change in the, in the, the governance of one of these systems, if, if there's uh, a hostile takeover or, or you know, some set of uh, actors essentially forms a cartel and, and becomes 51% you know, of the network, or there is a um, material uh, vote that is going to change the economics of, of the underlying market that the token is powering, um, or you know, there's, there's some other issue that uh, ultimately creates maybe a compliance burden um, for your team because one of the primary stakeholders in uh, in a decentralized network uh, ends up uh, having their wallet address slapped on the the, the OFAC list or or, or you know, the, the the terrorist finance uh, list. Right. You're going to need to know about all of that, and you're going to need to flag all that information not necessarily not necessarily as a trade, but as part of your ongoing support and engagement with the particular mm -hmm. asset or ecosystem. So, um, I think information companies generally split. Um, their focus to uh, mercenaries or missionaries, I like to say. Um, and that's not necessarily a bad thing, but the mercenaries yeah. in this case would be the traders, the folks that need like the real-time price ticks, the the real-time blockchain data. And then um, some of the longer term, you know, more missionary companies, this is ultimately going to be informing the product teams, the compliance teams, and the, the long-term investors that are looking for patterns and, and entry points versus uh, timing a, a specific trade. Yeah, for sure. I think you you know you hit it on the head. I want to jump to Masari.io here because I, I use the the product and I'm trying to kind of get an idea here on a couple of things. One, I like the fact that you can move around in the assets section. I like the ability to go directly into the DeFi side over here on this side and then into the smart contract platforms, quickly giving you access. I also like the aspect of research. Are you guys going further into the research area? around supplying a lot more data to the average retail investor or, or in some cases, maybe family offices or, or smaller uh, organizations that are kind of going into that direction? Because I feel like that's a big void in the industry right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and actually, if you, uh, I don't know if you want to keep going through that, we could do almost a live demo if you, uh, if you want to click on something <laughs> like, so, um, if you want to click on something like Ethereum. Um, well, let's do it. Uh, we'll jump into Ethereum on actually the go smart and, contract. And, Yep. Sure. And, and, and you can kind of see the depth of data that we have here um, on a per asset basis. Um, right. You can you can look at the profile for for pro full project history. Right. You can look at the at the you know, markets tab to get an understanding of, of how these assets are trading across yep. pairs, across markets. Um, you can uh, obviously download some of the historical data. And then um, on the metric side, you can kind of plug these in either to a screener to get comparables or to the charting mm -hmm. interface. Um, which will allow you to go deeper on some of these you know, more fundamental uh, metrics. So go, if you go to charts, for instance, 
this you have to actually search for the date range. But if you, yep. if you yep. go over to charts, for instance, you can see in this uh, left column all of the different types of uh, data sets that we're currently ingesting around supply, mining data, exchange data and flows, uh, on-chain fees, et cetera. Yeah, I mean, I've found it to be a treasure trove of information, as especially when I explore different projects that maybe, you know, I don't know a ton about. This is usually, this is where I'll go to really going into deep dives on understanding the token itself or the project itself. Uh, I really mm -hmm. like the DeFi side of it. I, that's probably the one area that I would say I I wish there was more because <laughs> that's one one of the, as we kind of talked about, is one of the areas that there's not as much information out there that really go into a lot of these kind of metrics, which is going to be a great thing for you guys with all this new, uh, you know, <laughs> capital that you've raised. Just jump right well, into it. More programmers. <laughs> you, yeah, you're, you're exactly. You're making my pitch for me. Paul is a very happy the, customer. He's already paying <laughs> us. And uh, and he wants you to come work for us so that we can uh, we can build the the next generation of these tools, right? Did I get that but, pitch just about? That's right? perfect. That's perfect for all you <laughs> blockchain wizards out there. If you need a place to go, Masari might be the place. Uh, are you global? Are you how are you putting your team together? We are a global team. Um, at the beginning of COVID, we made the decision, like many other companies, to to go remote, um, uh, basically you know permanently. In our case. And um, we've, uh, I think, been really happy with the results so far. Um, yeah. It's opened up a, a tremendous um, uh, universe of talent uh, that I think we would have really closed ourselves uh, off to, and, and, and we wouldn't have nearly the, the you know, caliber team uh, that we do today if we were just focused on one geographic region, um, or you know, even one city as big as New York is, and, and as good as the talent pool is there. Um, so uh, we have folks in, in Hong Kong, uh, throughout Europe, uh, in Israel and, and all throughout North America, Latin America, um, contributing to the team. Uh, and then, of course, we have a, a headquarters in New York, um, and I'm in an undisclosed location uh, somewhere in the eastern seaboard. There you go. I like the fact that we've seen kind of this explosion in remote work, especially in blockchain, because I think it's opened up the market in terms of really getting the best talent, because it used to be, I mean, you know, mm -hmm. you had to get these certain types of visas, H-1Bs, to get your workers in, if you're in Silicon Valley, to kind of really bring in the best talent, which has been a big challenge. If you can get past the culture side of it and you can still maintain that to a certain, but I think with all the tools, a lot of that can still be achieved. Mm -hmm. It's going to be interesting to see how blockchain, especially companies who are really striving in this, because it's such a global economy uh, in terms of both development, you know, consumption, retail, acquisition, all those kind of, and then you have the global aspect of all the countries and a lot of the, uh, you know, just activity that's happening worldwide and 24 seven. So it's gonna be interesting to see how all that plays out. Last question to you, Ryan, and that is when you look at the global perspective, obviously you're seeing this in Europe, you're seeing this in South America, we've seen a lot of activity in South America around uh, just in general cryptocurrency, and then obviously in Asia, and then now, you know, we can't leave out China. What do you think, if you look at the US and where we are today, and we're a one to 10, where would you rate us right now in terms of our ability to kind of dominate, much like we, what we've done over the past 25 years in technology? It really all depends on what happens uh, with our leaders in, in uh, Washington, D.C. I think um, if we had uh, proactive leaders that were pro-growth, that were thinking about um, the very best infrastructure to install and, and to invest around to protect the dollar, yeah. particularly from the geopolitical you know, risks that um, that China and their, their new digital currency poses, um, then uh, the U.S. Uh, would be you know, somewhere in eight, nine or ten. Um, but uh, it just comes down to political will um, and and you know, willingness to engage and actually learn what this technology can actually do. Um, and, and today I put us more on the path, uh, you know, trending towards a, you know, a, a four or below in terms of friendliness. And, um, and in the kind of most dire uh, scenarios, you know, th this could be an outright hostile place uh, for developers to start building you know, these technologies. So um, I, I view you know, crypto as one of those innovations and blockchains as one of those innovations that opened up Pandora's box and there's no going back. But the question is, um, how counterproductive and short-sighted will our current uh, septuagenarian and octogenarian leaders in DCB uh, when they're actually crafting policy about things that they don't technically understand? 
So um, as has been, uh, I think, the case in, in you know, crypto public policy for the last eight years, the winning strategy is, you know, let this technology evolve and, and, and regulate um, centralized service providers that are handling customer funds and are, are, are responsible for um, protecting investors from fraud and, and you know, malinvestment and, um, and security vulnerabilities. And, and obviously, no one in the industry that I know disagrees uh, with that. But um, it really all depends on uh, how aggressively the U.S. government um, treats uh, private transactions um, and how uh, much liability they believe developers of some of these protocols have um, if they are misused. Um, and that's where yeah. we get into you know, cases that I, I think will, will ultimately, um, sooner than we think, be argued uh, in front of high courts in the U.S., if not the Supreme Court, um, in terms of precedent setting and where the line um, sits with First Amendment, Fourth Amendment, and uh, several other amendment rights uh, when it comes to, to protected speech and code and uh, the ability to um, uh, deploy open source uh, technology that can uh, that can be used by anyone. Yeah, I think you know I I got my career started in computer science working for Microsoft, and it was in the era of when the really the internet was born, and literally was working for Microsoft at the time in which we did not believe that the internet was going to be a thing. So you had a certain group of companies that have kind of moved in that space. And at that time, the regulatory powers that be just absolutely ignored it. They just let it run, obviously, you know, outside the military. And, but they let it run and it just, you know, it became something very special. And the United States became the de facto, uh, pretty much powerhouse in terms of innovation around that. I'm just surprised that we have not done that here in blockchain. The only thing I can think of is that this involves money. And that that's the big difference here, <laughs> which is going to be interesting to watch for sure. Well, uh, I think the the difference between uh, you know crypto entrepreneurs and, and legacy internet entrepreneurs is there's a lot more money um, out of the, the crypto entrepreneurial set than than there was with the internet. Uh, and and I no think doubt. in the last couple of weeks, in the last couple of weeks with everything that's gone on with the infrastructure bill and this kind of unintended or quote unquote unintended uh, consequence of, of misdrafting or, or kind of poor, poorly defined um, language in, in the version of the Senate bill that, that was passed. Um, I think you're going to start to see a lot more you know, political activism and, and engagement in DC um, from, no from, some, uh, from some pretty frustrated uh, folks that have been building for a long time and, and trying to act in good faith. Yeah, I think that's going to be the key. It's probably going to open up a whole new area for a lot of these uh, congressmen, senators, et cetera, to really begin new campaign developments, I believe, for the future, especially around technology. I mean, it's, I look at it much like what we've done in you know, the climate side of things and where that has moved. I think we'll see that in the blockchain side in terms of DC for sure. So it's going to be interesting to watch. Ryan Selkis, it's been great having you on the show. Thank you so much for stopping in. Good luck there at Masari. Thank you so much. Do it again soon. Excellent. You bet. All right, so you guys are tuned in over on the podcast right now. Make sure and leave us a, a rating over there. We'd love to get your feedback. And you're here on YouTube. The best thing you can do is subscribe to the channel and also share these videos out. What we're trying to do is hopefully engage and educate the community out there around new technology. Obviously, blockchain is one of the big ones that we cover here. But of course, if you have an idea for the show or maybe you want to talk to us about something you'd like us to cover, hit it in the comments below or you can always reach me on Twitter at Paul Barron. We'll catch you next time right here on TechBath.